She was in inguinal swelling. She's a female patient. She's known to have hypothyroidism. And she presented to the GP with right inguinal swelling. And GP sent her for pathology. So what is you, um, your differential diagnosis for inguinal region swelling? So there is a big difference between differential diagnosis of inguinal region swelling and enlarged lymph node in the inguinal region. Okay, so in, inguinal region is swelling, so really you have lots of things that can get enlarged in the inguinal region. You might have a hernia coming out from the canal, right? You might have a direct or indirect inguinal hernia or a femoral hernia as well in the same region. You might have an abscess, whether it's a sore, sore muscle abscess or um, a sort of um, abscess just literally coming the skin and the muscle or soft tissue infection in this area, specifically in uh, drug users who keep injecting themselves in this area, um, they might get an abscess. You might have an aneurysm and pseudoaneurysm in the femoral artery. In the vein, you might have a saphenovarix, okay? And um, you might have metastasis to lymph node or generally lymph node enlargement. So the differential diagnosis is quite wide here. Uh, however, I just mentioned a few of them. Most commonly, um, uh, talking about hernia and talking about the um, uh, lymph node enlargement as well, all right? So hernia, malignancy, metastasis, saphenovarix, and abscess, and you can add the aneurysm and pseudoaneurysm as well. What's your differential diagnosis for enlarged lymph node in the inguinal region? So here is the difference. Here we're talking about enlarged um, lymph node, and the other one we're talking about enlarged in mass in the inguinal region, okay? So lymph node, it could be one of two things, whether we're talking about lymphat uh, uh, um, lymphatic infection or lymphatic metastasis, okay? So in terms of infection, it could be primary infection in the lymph node itself, or reactive infection in this area, which is coming mainly from cellulitis or any sort of infection in the lower limb. Or maybe we're talking about lymphedema as well. Um, and you might have infection coming from distant areas like the inguinal region or the genitalia, all right? So basically we're talking about um, um, uh, sexually transmitted infections. And this could be v uh, uh, the uh, um, venereal diseases like um, uh, herpes simplex virus and cephalis and uh, lymphogranuloma venereum and uh, maybe chancroid. Uh, these are the sort of infection that we're talking about as venereal infections like lymphogranuloma, cephalus, chancroid and herpes simplex virus. And other malignancies in this area which can be either primary or secondary. So primary malignancy is like leukemia or lymphoma, and secondary could be squamous cell carcinoma coming from uh, whether the scrotum or the vagina or the vulva in a female patient with the cervix, or maybe um, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, melanoma as well in that area can lead to infection, okay? Uh, uh, sorry, can lead to lymph node enlargement. So what are the drainage? Um, what is the drainage of inguinal lymph nodes? So we're talking about two lowers, the lower part of the abdomen, and the lower limb and the inguinal region and the perineum and the genitalia as well. Um, so in this patient, they are telling you that we've done far needle aspiration cytology, but it was not satisfactory. So what could be the problem with inadequate far needle aspiration? So here we're talking about the far needle aspiration. It includes a technique of taking the sample and a technique of saving that sample until it reaches the pathology lab. So we might have a problem with technique of taking the sample, and that include inadequate sampling, all right? Oh, and the sample is usually taken by a small needle and it's under ultrasound guidance. If it was not done under ultrasound guidance, the samples might be very inadequate to, uh, to test by the pathologist. That's one. The second issue might be the problem with the technique of saving the sample until it reaches the pathology lab. All right, so inadequate smearing as well can lead to that. So we have two main reasons, like we mentioned, um, uh, not under, under, under ultrasound guidance or was done under ultrasound, but there is no adequate or enough tissue to be sent for pathology. Well, uh, next question is asking about the uh, skin conditions that could be associated with melanoma. So here I'm going to divide it into two things. We're talking about navi issues, so problem with the navus whether it's a multiple navi, that's one, or um, a big or large giant congenital navus, or maybe dysplastic navus, all right? So talking about navi, we have congenital big pigmented navus, or multiple navi, or dysplastic navus, okay? Or we have three conditions like xeroderma pigmentosa, and albinism, 
and Fitzpatrick disease uh, type 1. Okay, so what are the risk factors of malignant melanoma? That includes so many risk factors. So the age, uh, the, the older you are, the more likely to get malignant melanoma. Being immunocompromised or HIV is also risk factors. Being a male is another risk factor. Having family history of malignant melanoma is another risk factor. Having own history or personal history of malignant melanoma is another risk uh, 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 factor. And um, yeah, that's uh, pretty much it for the risk factors and also history of melanoma, Hutchinson, melanotic freckle being immunocompromised and also red hair or uh, sun exposed area. So red hair, that means you um, uh, lack of melanin cells, right? Type of malignant melanoma, I'll divide this into two broad types, all right? The two broad types can include um, uh, whether it's a, a spread, um, like sort of horizontal spread or superficial spread or sort of radial growth or radial spread or vertical spread on the other side, okay? So the radial spread can be four types. So we're talking about nodular or ocral happening and the fingers and the nails and the sole of the foot and the palm. Or uh, So nodular and um, uh, ocral melanoma or superficial spreading melanoma or something called lentigo malignant. You really need just to know the types, all right? And also we have vertical growth like desmoplastic melanoma. We have here a bit of information about each one. So lentigo malignant, it's having the face, specifically of an elderly man, superficial spreading, it's usually outward growth and the regular pattern or uneven order, uh, color. Um, acral melanoma, like we say, palms, hands, sole, and nails, and nodular melanoma, lumpy and blue black and color, and uh, grows faster and spread downwards and lumpy. All right, vertical growth like desmoplastic, it's rare and pigmented lesion having the sun exposed area. Commonest comments to look for on a pathology report. You're interested to know one, uh, uh, where is this melanoma? So the size site of this melanoma. Two, how big is it? The size of the excised melanoma. Three, the um, depth of invasion, which is Clark classification, and the thickness of that melanoma, which is Breslau thickness, and that will base your management on that. And also the mitosis and the degree of differentiation of that melanoma from the patient own tissue, and also presence of alteration or lymphovascular invasion of the surrounding structure or destined metastasis to lymph node. So you're interested to know all of that uh, for um, a management plan uh, purpose, really, all right? So we've said all of this, the size of the melanoma, the site, the breastal thickness, depth of invasion, alteration, mitosis, differentiation, lymphovascular invasion, and immunohistochemistry as well. Differences between malignant melanoma and the squamous cell carcinoma. So if you try to draw the epidermis, the epidermis is quite a thick area. So if you try to draw it and divide it into upper two third and lower third. So melanoma usually happen in the lower third of the epidermis layer. And the squamous cell carcinoma usually happen in the upper two third of the, um, the epidermis, epidermis layer of the skin. What is meant by satellite lesion? So if you have a melanoma in certain area in the body, it might start to spread by continuity and contiguity, local spread to the surrounding structure until it forms sort of a shape like a satellite, all right? So that's why we call it satellite lesion. So it is a local spread of malignant melanoma by contiguity and continuity to the surrounding structure, leading to multiple pigments coming out of it that looks like a satellite. Epithelioid cells, it's large cells with vesicular nucleus on one of its side, and also uh, highly xenophilic. Uh, it takes a lot of, um, uh, 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 basically, the um, the blue color in here, it means it's highly xenophilic. It takes a lot of the stain that's being taken by it. All right, so large, round cell, and uh, upon that xenophilic cytoplasm, and the prominent vesicular nucleus, and large nuclei as well, is present in the epithelial cell, all right? What are the poor prognostic factors in malignant melanoma? We mentioned a few risk factors for malignant melanoma, like the age of the patient, the thickness of the melanoma, the depth of invasion, the differentiation of the melanoma, and the, the local and distant metastasis of that melanoma as well. Uh, and being a male is a better risk factor. Having a family history, having personal history of previous melanoma, all of these uh, would be bad prognostication for melanoma. So tumor thickness, and the invasion we talked about it, 
I forgot the type of melanoma, which is very important, specifically something called by amelanotic melanoma, alteration and lymphatic invasion and regional or distant metastasis. All of these are bad prognostication for malignant melanoma. The good prognostication, we talked about some of them, young age and female patient and local located in the extremities. Um, and also the opposite of all of this will be the, 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 the good prognostication for malignant melanoma. Where would you like to examine this lady? So think in that, now we, we, we are aware that melanoma can happen locally and um, still there is a potential that it might spread, whether locally spread or lymphatic spread or distant spread, all right? So we need to really examine this lady in the primary site where the melanoma is and do good assessment to that. Do good assessment to the local invasion to the surrounding structures. And most importantly, do assessment to the drainage lymph nodes and most importantly, distant metastasis as well. So it might go to the abdomen, to the brain, to the surrounding structures and also to the um, chest, you can think about that. So uh, at the bone as well. So you need to examine the patient generally. So primary site, look at the melanoma and the whole limb, joint above, joint below, look at the nails, and metastatic side, the chest, abdomen, and brain, and pelvis as well. Well, the patient had subangle acral melanoma. Remember, the acral melanoma, this is the one that happens in the nails, the palm, the sole um, uh, 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 of the foot as well, all right? What's found, how would you treat this lady? We literally need to excise this melanoma with safety margin, okay? Uh, and following Breslow thickness technique, this includes partial amputation of the toe, plus sentinel inguinal lymph node excision as well um, to make sure that the patient doesn't have any uh, malignant cells inside. How can you know the phenotype? So when you're being asked about phenotype, and this question is very popular, I believe, about the phenotype of a tumor, usually it's done by something called immunohistochemistry, and I think it's covered somewhere else in, in our videos. All right, recent histopathological study of the lymph node in metastatic melanoma other than immunohistochemistry, and here what it comes when it be, uh, will be a little bit more difficult. That's why I leave here always a flashcard for these kind of questions because it's quite easy to forget them, right? There is something called the BRAF gene. Because that's what we, what we can do for this patient. So look for genetic mutation studies like BRAF gene. Um, genetic genes are responsible for familial melanoma. Again, that's a difficult question. So it's called um, CDKN2A and CDK4 as well. So remember CDKN2A and CDK4, it's quite difficult to remember these kind of questions. That's why I always leave them flashcard and keep repeating them. So the legion was excised and the presto thickness is 1.5. What would you do? So there is presto thickness. You don't really need to remember all the presto thickness, but more than one, usually you would probably need to re-accession re for the melanoma to make sure that we're having good or adequate safety margin around it. What to do to ensure adequate margin, there is something called frozen section and Mohs surgery, which is microscopic excision of these cells and immediately doing uh, uh, assessing the lesion, the excised lesion under microscope while the patient is still in theater to make sure if there is malignant cells, is still inadequate, we we'll do re-excision and send it and so on and so forth. I'm gonna skip this question, it's very difficult. What is next? Um, f so we've done, uh, this patient had lymphatic enlargement after the excision, what would you like to do? You'd like to examine these lymph nodes and take some samples, or maybe even excite the lymph node and send it for pathology, and you can do whole body CT to exclude distant metastasis as well. Confirming metastasis and axillary lymph node, and the excision was done. Post the excision, the patient developed painful swelling of the arm and shortness of breath. So this patient is obviously cancerous, right? Has malignant melanoma, so they are at higher risk of of having a venous thromboembolism, all right? So arm pain, that means they probably have a, 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 a venous thromboembolism in the deep, fest, deep veins of the arm. Desnia, that will tell you as well that they might, this, this thrombus might have gone to the lung and could, uh, cause pulmonary embolism. So probably you need to do a CTPA for this patient to exclude that. All right, the risk factors here, we have the Verkau triad, and that includes hypercoagulable state, having malignancy, venous status, or prolonged recumbency, and endothelial injury for any reason. How do you manage this? 
to be honest, uh, uh, the management that's written here is not really comprehensive. So you would like to examine your patient and do uh, an ultrasound or the deep venous system of the arm and do CTPA and start them a treatment. However, you need to assess your patient first. And if they are hemodynamically stable, you can do what I just mentioned. And if they are hemodynamically unstable, you need to do a crash call and start them in thrombolysis immediately other than they might die from the pulmonary embolism. Management in this patient, like we said, this patient developed post-operative infection. Uh, can you give me an example of gram-negative diplococci? This is BNHAM. Uh, so B is pressure losses and um, N is nice serum and um, H is hemophilus influenza and um, A is actinobacter and um, M is moraxilla catarralis, uh, suprosilla and nice uh, and uh, hemophilus and actinobacter um, and also moraxilla. Example gram positive that's enterococcus and pneumococci or streptococcus pneumoniae, pneumococci. That's why I should remind you of being a cocci. Uh, next patient, the patient got severely toxemic with rapidly spreading infection in its arm. You need to think at this stage about necrotizing fasciitis. What could happen to the lung and severe infection? Something called adult respiratory distress syndrome. And it is completely covered in a different video that you can uh, look out for it. Thank you.